So welcome to Cafe Europa Online. Uh, it's a programme of the Hampshire European Movement to provide a point of contact for those of us who remain committed Europeans and to provide information on topical subjects. Tonight's talk will be recorded and will be available from our YouTube channel where you also find last month's talk. You can also find the link on our website at www.hansforeu.org. If you enjoyed tonight's talk and you're not on our mailing list, you can sign up for our mailing list to be notified about future talks at the website. Uh, tonight, we're addressing the subject of settled status for EU citizens who wish to remain in the UK. Settled is a new charity to support them. Our speaker tonight is a volunteer advisor with Settled who will be familiar to many in Winchester. Please welcome Patrick Young. Hi everyone, um, thanks for the introduction Will. Um, uh, hopefully that is a, a good thing that I'll be recognised by some familiar Winchester residents. So I'll, I'll try and take that in the right um, in, in the way it was intended. Um, so uh, first of all, um, when we set up this talk, uh, this was pre-COVID. So um, unfortunately, since the um, uh, a lot of the training that I would have hoped to have had by now has not been able to happen. Um, some of the um, uh, different experiences I would have liked to have had by now by going out and meeting people in the community has not, um, has, has, there's been a lot of restrictions on that, of course. So um, bearing that in mind, uh, I'm going to give you as much information as, as I can about settled and the work that it's doing and, and what we're hoping to achieve and any questions that you might have that I may not be able to answer um, in the in the first instance I'm going to give my uh, contact details to you all at the end and you'll be very welcome to, to speak to me and if there's anything that you're hoping to have an answer to this evening that I can't give you then um, I'll do that at the end. So um, I thought I'd start just very briefly by giving a little bit of my own background. Um, my, uh, my mother was a uh, Belgian. She was born in, 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 in Brugge and she came here when uh, she was young to become a nurse. And um, uh, ultimately she married my father and she uh, stayed here and became a British resident because at the time dual nationality wasn't available to people from, from Belgium. Uh, my father is a, a Londoner um, and his own family, uh, one side is from Dublin and the other side is from Cork. So on a personal level, uh, I've always grown up with uh, a real sense of, of feeling like a, a, a European and um, uh, feeling a part of, of, the, of the European community. And... Um, uh, you know, I was uh, I, I did what I could to, to campaign to remain in, in within the EU, and, and I was upset at the, at the result that, that, that we got. So, um, I currently work for Unison, the uh, uh, the trade union, which is the, the largest trade union in, in the country, and uh, we represent largely people in the public sector. Um, we have uh, approximately a million and a half members. About 85% of our members uh, are women and they tend to work in schools, in hospitals, for local authorities, um, a, a wide variety of public sector jobs and a very large number of our members are actually migrant workers um, and a lot of those are migrant workers from EU backgrounds. So I first became involved in Settled as a result of my work with, uh, with Unison when I was asked to help with a project at Southampton General Hospital. And that was specifically with staff working for Serco. So um, they're already marginalized within their wider workforce because they're working for a private company, not the NHS. So they're on lower wages, they're, um, uh, you know, they're on, on poorer terms and conditions. Uh, they're not as involved or as a part of the running of the hospital as somebody who's employed by the NHS. And uh, Settled wanted to get in touch with as many uh, people from EU backgrounds as possible. Southampton, of course, is a, is, is a port. It's got a, a very 
um, diverse um, community, um, you know, a long history of, of welcoming people from different countries and different backgrounds. And we knew that the demographics of our of the workforce, particularly the circle workforce um, at the hospital would, would be the kinds of people that Settled wanted to reach. So I said that I would help from a trade union perspective, help them get in touch with the different people um, uh, working there and became more involved and more interested in, in, in the wider aims of what Settled were doing at the time, particularly when uh, meeting uh, some quite appalling attitudes from, uh, from members of staff there who were recycling the kinds of misconceptions and um, prejudices that you know we've all become familiar with over recent years that um, their colleagues are, are only here for you know for because they're, they're, they're trying to flag social security or they're or they're not working at all or all kinds of different things and I won't go into that too much now and that that made me realize how important it was to uh, try and make that project a success and um, at the time, uh, it would still propose that there would be a fee involved for um, uh, eligible people to have to pay to get this settled status. And we negotiated with Serco that Serco would meet the cost of that, because at the time it would have been extremely expensive for an individual or family. And we we're very pleased as a trade union to persuade the millionaires at Serco to cough up a, what, what is actually a tiny amount of money. From, from their perspective. So um, that's how I first started getting involved with Settle from personal background, but I don't want to get uh, too hung up on that. What I thought I would do first of all is tell you a little bit about uh, Settled, and I've got some slides to help me demonstrate that. And um, what I would hope um, at the very least from, uh, f from your listening to me this evening is you would look at the Settled website, you would learn a little bit more about what the organisation is doing, and you would, you, you would take the opportunity, if you can, if not to get involved formally, but look at some of the ways that you can help in an informal basis, through your work, through your social life, just through the general way that you, you know, day-to-day -day, um, live in. So I'll start with um, those slides, and hopefully this will this will work okay. Settled is uh, was a, set up by EU citizens to guide, inform, and assist uh, other vulnerable EU citizens with their EU SS uh, applications. And uh, the people that we need to 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 help. Um, uh, people need to take particular advice with getting a settled status if, as you can see from the slide, if they have any criminal history, um, if they don't have access to the internet, if they have difficulty understanding or, or reading information online, um, if they're a victim of domestic abuse, they could be victims of trafficking or modern slavery, they may be in care or uh, have recently left care. Uh, they could be homeless or sleeping rough, or they could be working in the gig economy. Now, I'll get into uh, a bit more detail uh, a bit later on in the presentation about the kinds of people who are in danger of, um, uh, of, of, of missing out in, in complying with this scheme. Um, and uh, uh, for a lot of people, it, it, it's not a problem. They log on to their computers and it it, it, it doesn't take very long it's an easy process and uh, I've seen lots of comments on uh, Facebook and other forms of social media and things like that where people have made comments like well my girlfriend did it and it only took us 20 minutes and I don't see what the problem is if we can do it why can't everybody but it, it's far more complicated than that as um, um, I'm sure you know and, and hopefully I help to to demonstrate so um, people that work for uh, settled status or are volunteering for settled status are being called, I wouldn't use this description for myself personally necessarily, but they're being called settled status angels. And they've been asked to run sessions within their communities and assist with simple queries. So for myself, uh, I'm taking every opportunity I can within my day job as a, as a union, trade union organizer to meet with vulnerable people, 
um, to work with employers. So that might be large employers like unitary authorities or outsourcing companies um, or the NHS or uh, National Probation Service, something like that, to try and make the employers and, and the management understand the, the potential risks to, to their staff um, and also engaging with members as well. And as I was saying at the, at the beginning, um, of course, that's been put on hold to a large extent um, because of the, the difficulties with the coronavirus. And of course, it's been harder for us to meet with people uh, on a personal basis. But the people volunteering are managed and supported by this team of coordinators and they're being trained to, uh, trained to provide um, uh, OISC level one advice and for anyone that doesn't know OISC is the Office of Immigration Services um, Commissioner. So anybody that might be interested in, in, in becoming involved and I'll give you details about to do that later, uh, you, you can get a, a qualification out of it. It's, it's the most basic level of, of being able to offer immigration advice but um, it's still a really interesting thing to, uh, uh, to learn. So Settled are trying to ensure that every citizen in the UK has the opportunity to retain the right to reside in the UK uh, after the 31st of December 2020. So that's my initial part about, uh, about there. So stop sharing for a minute. And I've got some other slides to move on to. So just bear with me a second, hopefully this will work. Um, I should say that the, the, the slides that I'm going to move on to in a moment are partly designed for uh, a different audience than yourselves um, for a presentation that I might give to, um, uh, as I say, management or employers or to uh, units and branches. So um, uh, just... It, it, it's, it's not supposed to be an advert for Unison. I mean, if you're not in a trade union, then uh, I, I certainly suggest that you, you, you join one immediately, but um, just take away, it's, it's, it's not intended, the, the Unison references on some of the slides. So I, will. So, um, I don't want to get too bogged down on, in, uh, uh, on Brexit. You, you, you all know yourselves, um, the, uh, uh, the difficulties that, um, uh, people have had with this, um, but it does feed into it uh, a little bit. Um, oh, yeah. Goes back to the hostile environment, I think. So um, in 2012, um, Theresa May said that the aim of the hostile environment was to create in Britain a really hostile environment for illegal migration. And they said, she said that what we don't want is a situation where people think that they can come here and overstay because they're able to access everything they need. Really despicable uh, language she was using. The hostile environment is a set of measures, both administrative and legislative, to make life so miserable for anyone without immigration status that they will self-remove. And it includes limiting access to employment, to housing, to healthcare, uh, could include confiscation of a driving license, freezing bank accounts, uh, restricting rights of appeal against home office decisions. And the rules are purposefully designed to be very complex and difficult to understand, particularly um, to uh, the kinds of people that they're applicable to who may not have English as a, as a first language or may not even have it as a second language. So um, beyond that as well, the Home Office has got a, a long history of uh, uh, appealing decisions um, and delaying appeal processes unnecessarily and dragging things out. And they've even got quite a history of non-compliance with uh, court orders. So as a part of this, um, long-standing Commonwealth citizens back in 2014, had the um, protections to deportation removed by Theresa May. Uh, these were protections that were put in back in 1999 by Labour uh, in their Immigration and Asylum Act, and they were designed to help people who had become students 
or on temporary work visas or lost their documents or something like that. And we all saw the contemptible effects of this with the, with the, the Windrush scandal. Um, people being contacted out of the blue, being told that they were going to be deported. And, and, and people are saying deported? I'm from Deptford. Where are you going to deport me to? So for people who have lived here for decades in some circumstances, who are really a vital, you know, real part of the fabric of this country, pay their taxes, they are, you know, they're, they're British in every sense of the word. People who have been here for years and years and years who know nothing different. If they're being treated this poorly, how do you expect the government to treat uh, a, a, a janitor from Bulgaria who's only been here for a couple of years or um, a supply teacher from, from Hungary, again, who's not been here very long. We know they're not going to be treated sympathetically. We know they're going to be treated of poorly. They're going to be treated with suspicion. They're going to be marginalised. And that's what's really feeding into this settled status scheme um, at the moment. So uh, again, just to forget the unison stuff at the top there, just some important statistics. Um, you can see the large numbers of people in the public sector who are migrant workers, 15%, and increasingly um, our, our healthcare sector, social care sector, public services are really reliant on, on these workers. Um, so, there's nearly 4 million um, EU and EEA citizens living here who contribute to the social and economic life of the United Kingdom. Many of them, of course, play a huge role in supporting our public services. And uh, approximately half a million in the UK are employed in public administration, education, and the health sector. Um, over 150,000 EU nationals work in social care and health organisations. And you can see the statistics. 58,000 in the NHS, 84,000 in adult social care. So it's so vital that we do everything we can to protect these people because they're providing such an essential and valuable service to, to each and every one of us. So it's so important that we, uh, that, that we help them. So just don't worry about these slides for the moment, unless, unless you want to negotiate with your employers, in which case, um, Speak to me after and I'll tell you how to do it. So um, again for uh, uh, the EU settlement scheme is uh, was been brought in because as a result of, of, of Brexit as, as, as you all know and um, I'm sorry if I'm telling you things you're already aware of, um, the uh, uh, all of the existing terms and conditions on which EU citizens are, are, in, are working and living um, uh, and, and being a part of this country have all essentially been uh, uh, withdrawn or subject to change and to, and, and, and to challenge. Um, people from Slovakia, Romania, Hungary, Poland, um, etc. the EEA countries, um, they all need to, uh, people from, citizens from those countries all need to apply. Currently, uh, people from the Republic of Ireland do not need to apply as they have uh, an automatic right to live in the UK, but uh, they may well want to secure the rights of any uh, non-EU uh, family members. Uh, at the moment, people with dual nationality um, uh, cannot apply. Um, so if you're a citizen from one of these countries, you live in the UK, um, you need to, uh, uh, sorry. I'm... So uh, this new state, so, um, so have a look. So who needs to apply? So the new status, as we know, is called settled status. People must apply before a certain deadline. Um, it's partly dependent on whether or not we, we are able to reach a, a, an amicable agreement with, with EU countries. Now, um, there's two different types of this status, uh, as people were alluding to in conversation earlier. There's pre-settled status. And that will be offered to people who have lived in the UK for less than five years when they apply. Um, and it's valid for five years only, 
and when that runs out, uh, people will need to apply for settled status um, uh, or when they reach five years residence. So um, if you have pre-settled status, you can work in the UK, you can rent, uh, you can buy accommodation, you can have access to healthcare, um, but some uh, aspects of social security may be, a strict, may be restricted uh, due to the additional conditions that apply with pre-settled status. And also crucially, if you leave the UK for more than six months in a 12 month period, you might lose um, your pre-settled status. So um, one of the um, uh, uh, people who are, uh, are listen was listening earlier and hopefully still listening now, was mentioning about students um, uh, returning home early, uh, particularly now because of the results of the, of the, the difficulties with the pandemic and they might wanna be with their families, um, all kinds of different reasons. So it's not, it, it's quite precarious pre-settled status. So there's lots of, it, it, you, you might have an illness in the family, um, which requires you to leave the, the country for a long period. You might have something to do with your work. Um, there might be something to do with your partner's immigration status, which means you have to leave. So it's not altogether secure. Then settled status will be offered if you can prove you've lived here for five years or more in the UK when you apply. Uh, now this gives you a version of indefinite leave to remain uh, with a right to work, uh, to rent or buy accommodation. Uh, gives you access to healthcare and social security provisions uh, such as benefits and access to education uh, on the same conditions as, as UK citizens. So people with a settled status, they then have the right to leave and enter the country. Uh, however, uh, if they're out of the country for five years or more continuously, um, then they would all, in all likelihood lose their settled status. Um, also, crucially, the difference with the settled status to the pre-settled status is they will, people will then have the right to family reunification with, with close family members. So, so for example, if um, uh, someone with settled status wanted to bring their mother over here to live with them or something like that. Um, and then uh, once people have settled status after a year, if they wanted to, I'm not sure why a lot of people would at the moment, because I'd revoke mine if I could, but after a year you can apply for British nationality. So um, I'm going to just stop sharing my screen for, for the minute because the rest of the slides probably aren't that interesting. So why is it so important for people to engage? So people need to understand that um, if you forget to or you're unable to apply for the scheme, Essentially, you lose all your legal status in this country. You'll be considered as an overstayer, and um, that's automatically that's a, a criminal offence. Uh, people who fail to comply will have difficulty accessing work, perhaps accessing housing, getting a bank account, using NHS services, any other social benefits, and effectively they'll be in, in limbo. Um, and it's going to be very, very difficult for, uh, for people. Um, so uh, before I get on to the, the, the main thrust of, of what I feel is important about the situation, which is the different types of people who are vulnerable to not complying, I just want to read a little bit from a, a, a Guardian um, article that was printed last year. Um, I wouldn't often quote from The Guardian, I'm much more of a morning star uh, kind of a guy, but this was an interesting, this was an interesting article. So um, this was about the experiences of an EU citizen who was trying to apply for the settled status. So in early May, Doris Ratnam sat at her kitchen table trying to scan her German passport with her mobile phone. She was applying for settled status in the UK. The new immigration status uh, that most of the 3.4 million or so EU nationals living in Britain need to acquire if they want to stay in the country legally after Brexit. Uh, Ratnam, who is 72 and has lived in London since arriving as an au pair in 1968, was annoyed that she felt obliged to apply under the scheme to remain more securely in a country she considers her home. Um, 
I've been here for 50 years, she said. She was flustered by the process of attempting to get her phone to suck all of her personal details out of her passport. Something was not working and we sat for 20 minutes in near silence as she moved the phone slowly over the cover of her passport as shown in a reassuring home office YouTube video trying to get it to read the chip inside the document. Move the phone to read the chip, Ratner muttered, studying the guidance notes. What am I supposed to do? Move the phone to find the chip. I feel very stressed, it's the technology. After repeated failed attempts, the app informed her that she had been locked out of the system for 24 hours. It would take her two and a half months, two visits to the local town hall, which was an hour on two buses each way, a 15 pound appointment fee, and numerous calls to a home office helpline before her status was approved. The process was very dispiriting, she said. I shouldn't be made to feel like a foreigner again after such a long time here. And the people that I've spoken to um, who are affected by this, this is something that comes up time and again. They're, some people have been here 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. They're more British than I am. But they've been made to feel like they're outsiders, like they're unwelcome, like they don't belong here, which is, is just is awful. It's, 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 it's very depressing. And, but the reason why I'm reading this um, particular part out of the paper is because this is a person that, um, to all intents and purposes, shouldn't have any difficulties in applying. Um, but you, you can hear what a, what, a, what a terrible time that she had. And we all know that every government, whether it's Labour or, or, or Conservative in the last 20 years, has nosed up every major IT project it ever started to, to put into to place. And it's been the same catalogue of, of errors with regards to the settled status. It was only available on certain types of phone. Um, the, uh, uh, and on the types of phone that it was available on, it, it wasn't working correctly. And it's been very, very difficult for people, even with a, with a sound grasp or, of computers and, and, and technology. So earlier on this year, The Guardian also reported that um, uh, approximately 900,000 people were still yet to apply for the settled status. It's difficult to judge exactly because we don't know for certain precisely how many EU nationals are here. It's in the region of about three and a half, four million, I think. Um, and the, the difficulty in getting the exact figures corresponds with uh, the difficulties that um, people will be facing in, 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 in trying to achieve this status. So I wanted to go through some of the types of sections of the community that are, uh, are potentially at risk of, of missing out on this with all the, you know, with the catastrophic results that will have for their lives. So, um, for example, um, prisoners and young offenders. So, um, uh, people, for a start, people might be in prison as something that's connected to their being trafficked. They might be forced into prostitution or, 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 or drug production or, or, or drug dealing or, or, or something of that manner. Um, but in any case, uh, anyone who's a prisoner or, or a young offender, they cannot apply whilst they're incarcerated. And any time in prison will not count towards their residency. Um, and uh, in any case, people who are on long sentences um, will be uh, in all likelihood automatically deported in any case once their sentence is finished. So that's thanks to something that Labour introduced that anyone on a 12 month sentence or longer can be deported automatically without any um, any, any, any leave uh, to, uh, uh, to argue that. So prisoners and young offenders are definitely very um, uh, uh, vulnerable category. Um, people in abusive relationships. So um, uh, of course, um, anyone could be the victim of an abusive relationship where they're in a same sex relationship, could be a, a man, but overwhelmingly, uh, the people affected in this manner are, are, are women who are victims at the hands of violent men. Um, their partners might not allow them access to computers. 
their partners may restrict their engagement with with friends with colleagues um, they they may have been trafficked um, they may not be known to local uh, authorities um, and if at such a time they, uh, they they did become known to local authorities I'm not entirely convinced that they would be treated with sympathy I think the first thing though that authorities would look to do would be to look at their immigration status rather than the fact that they may have been um, victims of abuse who have not through no fault of their own been able to engage with it it's certainly not a uh, something we'd want to leave to chance. Um, so uh, my phone's just turned itself off. So um, there's people at this in this meeting who would be uh, far more aware of uh, of this than than, than I am. Um, but uh, people in the travelling community are especially vulnerable to to missing out on this. Sometimes you have uh, whole families or even entire communities who have a single email address between them. Um, they may not uh, ha have mobile phones, they may have limited literacy skills, English skills. People in travelling communities often uh, are suspicious of, of authority, um, they, they're not engaging with, with, with local services, with existing services. And um, we've heard some really awful reports of how they're vulnerable to exploitation. So um, we've had a lot, a lot of um, uh, um, scamming uh, uh, lawyers in, in, in London who are approaching travelling communities and charging them vast amounts of money to get the settled status when of course it's it's free now and um, people are being ripped off and they, 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 they don't know um, that you know because they're not engaging with the authorities they're, they, they're, they're, they're not aware that they're being ripped off and it's a real danger that people are being asked to part with vast amounts of money for a service that might not get them what they want or, or is achievable for free. Um, other uh, sections of the community that are vulnerable to missing out, children of course, they're at the mercy of their parents' understanding, they're at the mercy of their parents' willingness to engage and um, again they might not be known to local authorities if, if they have parents who are abusive, if they have parents who are vulnerable in their own respects and then elderly people um, now they might take their status for granted they, they might feel that it's not applicable to them they might not have kept up with it because they think because they've lived here for a long time they presume that they don't need to um, uh, to engage with the process um, they might have a lack of understanding of the of the technology um, you know my father's in his 70s he doesn't know how to send a text message um, and I'm sure that uh, applies to a, a, a lot of people um, they might have problems with literacy as well they could be ill they might be in care homes so they could be isolated they could be away from their relatives um, and uh, they might live in rural areas so it's very very difficult for uh, a lot of elderly members of the community to engage um, and then homeless people, of course, um, I guess I'm stating the obvious to an extent, but um, besides the, the, the lack of engagement, the lack of an address, the lack of access to, to the procedure, to the processes themselves, um, a lot of people who are, uh, uh, who are homeless, they have substance abuse issues, they have mental health problems, um, and these are all barriers to, um, uh, to their successful engagement. Um, some of them might be homeless because they've been victims of trafficking. And if they're victims of trafficking, then again, they're particularly vulnerable to, to missing out on this. They, they might have been forced into prostitution. They might have been forced into um, working in, in the drugs trade or in other criminality and have no choice in that. Um, and uh, again, if such a time came that they were able to engage with the authorities if they were able to escape their abusers for example again I, I don't trust this government to deal with them sympathetically and if they've been here a number of years and they're not complying with the scheme I, I, I think there would be a serious risk of, of, of deportation and again similarly people in mental health institutes um, and, and people in general who are digitally excluded or, or 
um, have literacy or, or other uh, technical problems. So um, there's lots of different things that um, uh, people uh, who care about the situation can can do, um, and d different ways that you can you can help just in your day to day lives and within your community. So um, some of you might be churchgoers. And, um, we, you know, we would want you to engage with people in your congregations who are, um, who you know to, to be from um, an EU background. Um, and, and of course, we can advise on the ways that you can get into conversations with people. We're not suggesting that you, you walk up to someone and say, oh, right, mate, you're from Poland, aren't you? Are you illegally? You know, there's ways that you would, that you can approach these conversations. But, um, you know, there's ways you can engage with your your, your employers um, and and your own managers, your own departments, with your schools, um, and if you're visiting relatives in care homes. I know my own. Um, I've got a lot of experience, not just of working in care homes, but in close family members being residents of of, of care homes, and so many of the staff there who do a wonderful job. They're from Romania. They're from Austria, they're from Latvia, they're from France, they're from the Netherlands, they're from Portugal. These places couldn't survive without the, 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 the EU workers there. So without doubt, if you have family that you're visiting in, in care homes, you have the opportunity to, to ask management if you can leave leaflets in the staff room to get involved with, uh, in conversations with, with people. Um, and it's just having that awareness um, uh, of of neighbours, of uh, of colleagues, of, of people you're getting in conversation with, just trying to learn a bit more about it, and and, and trying to make sure that, that people are engaging. Um, so that pretty much brings me towards the end of the of the presentation, as it is. Um, I hope it's been uh, interesting. It's the first time that I've done it. Uh, I managed not to uh, somehow uh, leave a lot of my notes <laughs> on on my other computer. So sorry about that. There are some bits that I missed. But the main thing that I wanted to get from this is is not that I'm uh, a, an, an expert on uh, on these issues because I, I'm not by any means. I've I've not very long started um, engaging with settled and 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 again. Um, Due to the, 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 the pandemic, I've not been able to get as trained or as involved as I would have liked to up to this point. But what I really want to get out of this is an awareness that Settled exists and there are lots of different ways that you can help, even if it's just by logging onto the website, getting a proper understanding of the situation. We can send you leaflets, we can send you um uh, links to um to, to pdfs and to um presentations and to all kinds of things that you can share in your community we all um you know as i say normally i would do this look to do this presentation to um uh, uh people in the workplace or, or or something like that but for yourselves i'm making a presumption about a lot of the people on on who are listening but for yourselves i'm sure that you're in regular contact with people from from ee backgrounds um and uh you know they, they themselves might have good um contacts within within the, the polish community within the french community so even if they themselves have a good awareness of the situation even if they themselves have had no problems filling out the the, uh, the, the the form and engaging with the process, they can help us to reach the people who are struggling and the, the people who will have difficulty. So um, if anyone's got any, any questions, um, uh, now's the, the time. I don't know if you want to let people ask um, vocally, Will, or write it down on the chat or however you want to do it. And, um, uh, uh, hopefully this has been uh, interesting for you. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. That's been very excellent. Um, I was going to suggest taking a short break, but as there are many of us, people might be happy to move straight on. Um, I think, again, because it's quite a sort of intimate group, I'm happy for people to 
unmute their microphones, but perhaps to avoid everyone talking at once, um, if you put your questions in the chat, oh, and then that. we'll perhaps invite people to sort of ask their question, um, and Patrick to respond to. Um, you all right, Pat, to sort of carry straight on? Do you want a break? Or? Yeah, absolutely. If anyone, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Can, so, I, can if, I just say something? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, no, I just want, want to pick up on something you said about settled status. One major issue about settled status is that you don't get a card. You don't get any physical evidence at all from no, this government. Well, and um, that's a well, problem because, you know, you, even when you, it's, yeah. you know, for a simple thing as like, joining your local library, you get a plastic card. But for something like that, where that proves you've got the right to work and live in the UK, you don't. And I think that's that's done on purpose from the foot from the home office for that certain people because the onus is put on employers landlords um such like you know to to check yeah people's, absolutely. Uh, so, people's uh, residency and it's open to uh, abuse because you know you have to take people on their word yeah absolutely uh, and also a uh, border control you know you have the, the customs officers are supposed to know from their screen if you're illegal or not and that's yeah. never going to work and that's a major issue, and the three million are on it, as, as I know, and to force the government to issue physical evidence, but it's not happened yet. Absolutely. So, um, when when people get uh, the settled status, they they could download like a, I think it's a sixteen digit number. Yeah, but that doesn't. supposed to use that number for to 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 go. It's valid for thirty days, and within those thirty days. They're supposed to present that number if, if necessary to social security departments, to landlords, um, not to employers at the moment, but I, I don't think we're necessarily a long way away from, from that. I can, I can say that's right. that also, uh, they, in the future that they will have to present when, that to, to employers. When they get their subtle status, I know that from a Polish family I, I've uh, talked to, they get an email, which often ends up in the spam, so we don't think yeah. about looking in there. Uh, but it, even though it's an email, it does say in the email, this is no evidence that you've got residency, that you've got legal status. So, no, right. you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really big problem. Difficult. And then it's sorted out, really. Yeah, and it, it's just, um, you know, it's the way that it marginalises people is just so ghastly that you're reducing people to a 16-digit number and encouraging this idea that um that everyone's on the take and they shouldn't be here and and um it, you know it's just a, a breeding ground for racism isn't it right well, yes. uh, john gaskell did you want to ask your question uh yes thank you um i understand that um something like 40 percent are getting pre-settled status having filled in all the forms and uploaded all the bank accounts for the last seven mm. years or whatever um is that because 40 percent have been here less than five years or is it due to a target that's been set by government for settled status do you know i'm uh, i'm afraid that i've don't think I could give you um, uh, a substantive answer to to that. I would be I would be guessing. I'm afraid, John. It's a very Sorry. interesting question, and uh, uh, apologies that I can't answer it properly. But um, uh, I, I I wouldn't be able to give you a definitive answer to that. I, w I, I would suspect it's a mixture of the two of, of the two things. Um, I can can I say what I think it is. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, the rules, immigration rules about the EU, as I say that anyone who's been here less than five years, is, even if it's just one day in the UK before the specified date, which is the end of this year, they will only get pre-settled status. But I think what was happening was that, you know, the application works um, via your national insurance number um, and there is an automatic check um, the way this application, online application works with, between the HMRC and DWP records of the applicant for the past seven years. And a lot of vulnerable clients, like Patrick explained, they are in and out of jobs, 
for mm. various reasons that, you know, they may not be even in jobs where they are properly on the books. You know, there may be many reasons why they have skipped the system. So they won't come up with a good match. So when that happens, uh, the Home Office asks um, then evidence of residence from the applicant. And as Isabel said, the onus is on the applicant to provide that evidence. So there are different types of evidence. For example, if you have a council tax bill or a P60 that covers 12 months period. So if you have five of those, which is really nice, then you only have to scan and upload five documents. But again, a lot of people don't have those. I can give you an example from our clients. We have a lot of East Timorese living in Oxfordshire uh, who, who have Portuguese nationality, but their English is quite poor, most of them. Uh, you know, educational background, attainment is low. They are in low paid jobs. And um, because they have been in and out of jobs, they don't know the importance of a P60 that you are issued is only once and you have to keep it safe. They throw it away when they move. They live in multiple occupation housing, overcrowded places, so they don't have a council tax bill coming to their name. It's very hard for them to get a, a bank account or even if they have one, the bank fobs them off, doesn't give them their bank statements because if you don't have one of these, um, documents which cover long periods, then you fall back on other types of evidence, which can range from bank statements to various other things. But with the bank statements, one statement is evidence of one month. So for any 12 month period, you need six of those. So five years, six times five minimum. So it's really hard for people to get these things. So what happens is when they, come, when they try to apply themselves before going to see an advisor, they don't understand emails, like Patrick said. They may not know what to do, how to provide. I think you read a really nice example of a lady who were capable, but how she or he had to travel various places. So imagine someone even less advantaged than that person, how difficult yeah. it is for them. Yeah, so exactly. the home office only gives them pre-settled because let's say they, you have one evidence, one piece of evidence, even though they've been here for five years, just because they couldn't prove it, they give them pre-settled. And last year that wasn't that much of an issue. I mean, it was still an issue, but they had time if they could still find that evidence and to apply for settled, like to withdraw the other application and to make a fresh one. Well, what happens after December 2020? They can't do that. So it's very important to get it right and to get the right status for these people so that in five years time, they don't fall out of the net again for whatever reason, well, because of their vulnerability and being an at-risk group. So I think that's what's happening. It's, it's, a, it's a legal loophole um, which they have devised this application and it's very hard for a lot of people to apply even though they advertise it as an easy scheme. And I'm not even supposed to be saying all of that because we are grant funded by the Home Office. <laughs> that is a fact, that is the truth. I mean, grant funded mean, means, I mean, we're st still providing independent advice, but you know, you don't want to be seen to be criticizing the Home Office too much, I guess, but that is the truth. The application isn't as straightforward as they claim it to be. No, so. it's, it's, it's supposed to be difficult. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's a political, yeah. yeah. It's, it's supposed to be difficult because um, a, a lot of the people who, who will find it hard to comply, the Home Office doesn't want them here anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. It's also done to discourage people to stay, to, to, to encourage people to go away, you know, on purpose. Yeah. Exactly. And also to pick up on what um, that lady was just saying, I read on the three millions, um, um, Facebook page recently, the Home Office has been refusing more and more uh, the recently. Yeah. Uh, they have been rejecting people more and more all of a sudden, you know, just before the end of the transition period. It's very strange that, isn't it? Really? I, I, that's, there is a reason for that, I think. I don't know. I let Patrick talk if you want first, but because no, they have introduced a right of appeal, which didn't exist in the beginning when, okay. when the scheme was first introduced people only could apply for administrative review, which 
which really was only the Home Office reviewing their own decision, but appeal is to a court or tribunal, which is different. Um, yeah, they weren't making much refusals because like I said, last year, you could just um, make a new application and they didn't necessarily refuse the, the application, which uh, didn't, didn't quite finish because of lack of evidence or something. But now, if, if something is missing, they are refusing them as an invalid application, which means the, in the eyes of the Home Office, that application has never been made even do you see what i mean it's not like refusing because something is missing but they just say this is an invalid application because you haven't complied with whatever the application requirements are right yeah. so okay um, would you like to sorry use something else on that as no, well? no no that's all i just was saying it's tough <laughs> yeah. um so um annette you'd put a question in the chat would you like to Awesome. Um, Feel free yeah. to turn on your camera if you want to. Uh, yeah, let me just find my where are we? Okay. Um, that's question is yeah, yeah. difficult as well. Yes. Um, I applied for my settled status right at the beginning because I work in a university and we were one of the trial mm -hmm. um, sectors to do that. Um, but I've been wondering about the way it's linked to your passport because you've obviously got mm -hmm. to scan your passport in um mm -hmm. and so it's linked to your passport number well my passport runs out next year you have to do it again no don't you well, think? i must have this 16 digit number i've got my email saying it's not official but yes it's official um I've lived in this country for the last 52 years. Oh, so, um, you know, I've been here nearly, well, nearly all my life. Good. Yes. Um, yeah. But it's one of those things which, um, you know, has concerned me as an individual. What happens when I apply for my German passport again, which I will do um, next December? And my settled status then disappears? Or how does that work? And I can't be the only one. I don't know. There must be a, I'm going to just check. My just trying to, so I'm just trying to refer to my, uh, to my notes. To and this, this is, um, this is something that, um, we have come across before. And uh, again, uh, apologies for not being exactly on top of my, uh, my game with this. The majority of my correspondence was settled is in, in my office in unison office in, in Southampton and, um, uh, and, and not here with me in my, in, 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 in our, room so um i don't have a lot all of it in front of me unfortunately and had to leave it there sort of quite arbitrarily at the beginning of the uh, 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 of the work from home but um i thought i had some notes on that here i can definitely give you an answer on that if you want to if, if if you're okay to email me i can get you an answer on that uh tomorrow if that's okay that would that would be helpful i'll leave yeah. my email in the chat for you okay. patrick Oh, I write that down. Sorry, I do. I, 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 I think I might know the answer, but I don't want to misadvise you mm -hmm. and then have to exactly. tell you something else. So I'd rather, I'd rather know for sure and get back to you tomorrow if that's, uh, if that's okay. I'd like to know the answer as well, though. Can you email me too? Absolutely. Who was saying that? Sorry, uh, Isabel. It's not who, who? Sorry, I'm losing. Christine. Oh, hi. Would you like to put your email address there as well? Okay. Um, so, and, that, and um, uh, absolutely, I can speak to. Um, so, again, you know, with this presentation, I didn't want to come on and 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 and, and make out that like I'm the leading expert or anything like that. But at the very least, I can get the answers from from one of my colleagues who who, who is a much uh, um, more informed than than I am at the moment. So uh, I've got your email and that's triple A zero seven dot com. And um sorry, the, the only name I've got there is Stephen um in my top right hand corner. Um I've just put it in the uh chat. Okay, um sorry, what's your name, big pardon? Christine. Christine, sorry Christine, the, the only name I have up there. Is, is the name of the gentleman um, yeah, sharing his side? Yeah. 
it's in the chat, Christine. See, okay, so um, what I'll do, I'll get in touch tomorrow and um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll get an answer for you tomorrow. Great. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any, any, any questions or, or points of conversation? I just put a link uh, in the chat. Can I, cha can I yeah, put yeah. it for everyone? Yeah. I think I have to change a setting. How do I do that? Uh, yeah, it's just a little drop down. So if you've done it to um, somebody in particular, then you can just change the drop down. To uh, I have done that now. So th there is a, oh, why didn't, ah, it has pasted. So this link is to, to update this de details um, once you have a status, but I still think you should, you should wait, Patrick, to get back to you. This is just very general information on the Home Office's website. And I heard, because there is something called a base camp where grant funded organizations help and communicate with each other. I heard um, someone mentioning there, I haven't experienced this yet, but there is something going on about this. Um, some people are finding it, it's difficult for whatever reason to update their details, but you can start reading that. This might give some information, general information. Thank you. That's that's You're that's, welcome. that's really useful. Thank you. Um, not, not everyone will have seen that. Um, and uh, and again, you know, th 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 this is information. It's online. So yeah, the, the people we, we're talking about who are not online, then exactly, not have it's the difficult for them to, to see this. Yeah. Even exactly. if they are lucky enough to live in a town where the library is still open. Yeah, exactly. There's no saying that, they, that, that, that they've got the ability to go on a computer and to, and to look or even know where to look. Exactly. Um, and also, like, for example, imagine someone on benefits, let's say, because during lockdown they lost their job or something. And also their passport changed. And because they, had, they didn't manage to make that change, so they can't now prove you know mm -hmm. what their status is so it's made it very hard for some people i think you're right exactly and this is you know it it it, it, it it's self-explanatory it's a hostile environment this is this is yeah it's all purposeful and you know because someone is 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 middle class and from paris yeah that don't, don't mean that they're not supposed to be targeted by this as well yeah you know, this is all this is this is this is a very systematic attempt to marginalize and discriminate against anybody who, who, who they perceive not to fit their standards of, of Britishness. Exactly. And suddenly making European nationals subject to immigration control in this kind yeah. of way for the first time in history is just unbelievable. But yeah. it is the new law. I can't believe why it is the law. No. Just wait till all these um Brexit voting Brits find themselves subject to immigration controls when they <laughs> I think so. Indeed, yes. <laughs> Indeed, well, you're right. You, that, you, you say that and that's often that's often quite quoted, but if you look at a lot of the constituencies where where they were quite fervently um for Brexit, a, a lot of these demographics, these people these are people that don't go abroad. So mm. they don't you know they well, so until I was quite old, or you know, like a, a, a late teenager, I, I'd never been anywhere but Belgium. So when we when we used to go family holidays to to Belgium all the time at Easter, uh, sometimes at Christmas, um, over the summer holidays, and um, while I was in Belgium, uh, when I was a kid, I was playing. If we stayed at we used to stay at the same Townsend Thorsen holiday camp. Uh, on, on the North Sea coast and when I was a kid I used to play with a kid from Turkey or a kid from the Netherlands or a kid from Germany or and it just was natural to me you see EU flags everywhere mm. I've got an understanding of it of, of, of what it means but a, a lot of these places the people who are voting to leave might not never have been abroad or <laughs> if they have been abroad they're going abroad to places of, for the British people so I, I'm not so sure that they will be experiencing mm. those kinds of consequences, to be honest. Unless they've been to somewhere that's full of British people, that they're still going to get it coming back. Like, like Benidorm or the Costa Blanca or something. Yeah. Yeah. 
but a lot of them are not a, a lot of these people they've never been abroad yeah. some of them have never some of them have never been more than which, uh, which again uh, you know proves the point that i've been saying to people for four years it was a racist xenophobic vote anyway you know people like you said we are all we are all human beings whatever the, the, the country we come from why should we reject somebody else because they come they come from a different country you know that's that's, that's the, that was it that's why they voted the way they did you know or they're not English. like you said we don't uh, match their britishness so obviously we, we are other so we must be rejected that's what the idea that was the idea yeah. wasn't it that's right, yeah. i guess there's been a whole generation of young brits who scarcely regard europe as abroad because yeah. they've, they've always had that right um, that's yeah. right yes and and equally there's um quite a large number of uh, Brits who have lived abroad and are living abroad, something like two or three million, I believe. Yes, yeah, Spain, for have, example. Have, have in Spain or uh, France, France or whatever, yeah. and are in a similar but different situation mm -hmm. with EU so, citizens yeah. in this country. Yeah, because they are um, losing their, they've, they've lost their, they were going to lose their freedom of movement. So they are stuck yes, in the country yes. they live in now. Yes, I think it's, it's even worse than that. I heard in an ILPA parliament TV event that their, their pensions and things will be affected. Yes. yes. I think after Brexit, you know, British who live in another European country, I think something's happening with the pensions and it's going to be very hard for a lot of people and also for the disabled British people. It's going to be harder for them to travel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, it's a mess. It's healthcare, especially. They're going to have to. They won't be able to um, to join the local healthcare um, yeah. where they yeah. live now. So they'll have to yeah. have private insurance or something. So for a lot of people, it's going to be very difficult. Exactly. And I think some of them will have to come back to the UK, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And and then again, there's British people with existing health conditions. Mm. who won't be able to go abroad because yes. they can't afford the insurance. Yes. Yes. They, their insurance is refused. Yeah, yes. that's going to be terrible. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I want to ask a question to William, if that's OK. okay. Um, there, is some, uh, there are two campaign organizations in Oxford that I know of and I'm involved with uh, who are campaigning uh, for Britain to stay in Europe um, for, from the start. I was just wondering, they mentioned to me a Cafe, Cafe Europa event, a live, um, you know, real-time event before the lockdown, and I was invited and I was going to join at, at the end of March, and obviously it never happened because the, of COVID. I was wondering whether this Cafe Europa is a regional thing, different organizations organize it in their regions, or you have contact with someone um, who specifically deals with Europe, Cafe Europe, and I can get in touch to do a similar event with them in Oxford. Okay, I, I think there's a couple of things here um, okay. that have sort of happened more or less in parallel. So um, there have been a few places that were organising what they called Euro cafes, which were more of a sort That's of... That's it. Um, so just be to meet up in a place and yeah. you'd generally be welcoming to uh, mm -hmm. people from the EU for just general chat or, or stuff like that. Um, this Cafe Europa was something that we started up in the Hampshire European movement. I um, see. Different. It's, on, it's on the back of, um, I run Winchester's Cafe Scientific and we thought it would be a nice idea to try out um, this similar format mm -hmm. um, but around the European theme as a way of engaging the members of the Hampshire European movement. Very good. And very open to other people picking up the idea and, and taking it forward in, in their own areas as well. I see. Um, but yeah, essentially Cafe Europa in this kind of format where you actually have it, somebody um, along as a speaker um, to uh, impart some information and answer questions is something specific that, that we've done. I see. Okay. Very for other people to copy it. Okay. You, you can always start your own one in Oxfordshire, though. I guess, but you know, it would be nice to work with a 
because we are like a charity and we do advice like settled it would be nice to do it uh, with someone and with some organization like william and the hampshire the organization he's involved with in hampshire uh, equivalent of that in oxford i meant but i will take it to them in the next in the next meeting i think i got confused you're right euro cafe and cafe europa is not the same thing but i somehow put the two together and thought that they are the same but it's they're not similar similar concept and they, they both evolved independently at about the same time um, yes i see and i mean we have the advantage now because we're having to do things online that people can join from literally anywhere exactly and, and they're very nice. welcome to um nice we've got we're working on having some quite big names um in the future so we've got professor patrick dugan from the university of liverpool ah. talk in october he's the um con the irish constitutional lawyer very who, good uh, you've probably seen doing various talks online he, he's yeah. amazing and we're working on one or two other big names as well okay. so. am, am i not a big name then william <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. I can yes. be a middle, middle, middle name, and <laughs> William can invite me before the professor. Maybe <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. Um, if you, I mean, you're not on the telly. Look at, sorry, William. I said you're not on the telly, are you? Come on. <laughs> well, not, not at the moment. Not a celebrity. <laughs> not yet. I, I, I have here in the front row at the football match. <laughs> <laughs> um. What I've done is I've if you if if you look on the chat, I've put my name, uh, my email address there, my work email address. So ah, thank you. I can I'm, I, if you get in touch, I'm quite happy to put you um, onto to some of my colleagues in 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 Ox in the Oxford area. Yes, thank you. Not Patrick. just Oxford just as well, copying. but Bailey the White Horse and um, Bucks and uh, all, all around that way. And for anyone else who would got any questions or would like some information uh, about Settled, then do please drop me a line and do please have a look at the website as well. We're, William has put the, uh, you put a link to the website further up the chat, William, is that right? That's right, yeah, I'll, I'll so, pop it in again so people can see yeah, it. Yeah, so do, do please have a, a, a look at the website and do please give some consideration to, um, to, uh, to, to, to join in. And even if you, you know, if, if everybody here reached out to one person would be, would, would, would be a massive uh, achievement no. um, because they in turn might reach out to someone else. So do, do please have a good look at the website and look at the different ways in which you can, you can get involved and you can, you can help to make a difference. And if you want some contacts for the Oxford area, if you can just put your contact details into the chat. I will. Yes. Thank you. I will just do that before we, at the moment. Um, okay. Well, that, that brings us to the end of the formal meeting and many thanks to Patrick for an enlightening talk and to all for attending.